All right, let's get uh, started. So I'm still not Adam Dupay. Didn't fight crime for an uh, entire two days. No such luck. Uh, all right. Yesterday we left behind uh, networking, uh, and today we're going to jump into application security. There's a topic uh, much near and dear to my heart, even though networking is very much uh, immediately applicable and so forth. Um, any questions about networking for me? What? Anyone realize that, hey, since Tuesday, I forgot what my theater was. All right. Did we, uh, there's no homework we need to give up? <laughs> Brilliant. All right. So we're going to dive into application security today. I recognize a couple of pages from my uh, 466 class. Who, who here is from 466? All right. Just a, a few people. So this might be kind of a, a review with a horrific twist that we'll get to it in a moment. But for everyone else, it's application security. Uh, in that, the security of networks is super important, the security of uh, whatever other stuff you learn in the course uh, is super important, uh, crypto and so on. Uh, but in that, we use computer support applications that are running on them. No one, I mean, I'm sure people do, but it's kind of rare to just network together a computer and be like, oh, that's cool, or that not use it for anything. Um, Applications run on these computers either for local use or for remote use. Uh, local use, you might have a word processing app, um, Vim, uh, whatever people write essays in these days. Uh, remotely, you have, of course, Apache, uh, Postfix, MySQL, et cetera, all these network services that uh, kind of power the modern uh, web, the modern internet. Uh, and, and so on. So these applications are very important. And uh, the interesting thing is despite everything that an attacker or that uh, someone who wrote these applications rather might have <laughs> hoped and dreamed for, the behavior of the application is not determined by hopes, dreams, and uh, design. It's determined by the specific code being executed. So today we're going to dive into what that code is being executed uh, is, and um, what the environment of it is, and so on. And probably we won't get to it today, but uh, next class we will uh, go through, or Adam will go through with you or whatnot, um, various attacks that can be mounted on an application to violate this sort of confidentiality, integrity, availability properties. Right? You've all gone through the CIA triangle. Um, fun fact, I first saw the CIA triangle when I arrived at ASU as a professor. So, uh, but it kind of, I guess, a reasonable abstraction way of looking at it. So let's look at how applications run. An application doesn't run in a vacuum. An application runs in a machine that is configured, that is on a network, that is running a specific operating system, and has a specific file system. Um, and this file system is used by uh, the application for resources, libraries, etc. Um, and the kind of application file together with its environment are all loaded into memory in an operating system to create a process. And that's typically what you interact with as a user when you're running an application. And then application vulnerability analysis is the idea you take an application and you look at it very closely and you check if it has a vulnerability that you could exploit. And there's a number of uh, vulnerability sources. 
places where vulnerabilities can be introduced. Uh, one is vulnerabilities can be introduced in the original design of the program. So I said what actually matters, the, the, the actions that are actually executed are done so by code running on your computer. Well, you don't start an application's life in code. You don't think, oh, I'm going to write an application that's going to do int main, open bracket, blah, 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 all right? You think, I'm going to write an application that is going to load a file from a hard drive and display it as a CAD GIF or something. So in that design process, that first step, oh, I'm going to create this application, you might introduce vulnerabilities. And we say, I'm going to create an application that will display cat gifts. And you know what would be cool if on the bottom of the screen it displayed my password? That's like a design <laughs> level vulnerability. You can have an implementation level vulnerability, right? You're implementing the, the um, program. You write a creative program that can load cat gifts. Uh, you don't intend for it to be able to display your password, but it turns out that the way you wrote it, anyone using it can open any file, not just cat gifts, and so they open your password file. Um, and then you can have deployment vulnerabilities, where you think of that, think, okay, while well, during implementation you catch that bug, you prevent arbitrary files on the system from being open, but by accident, as you're deploying the application, you install it together with your password file in the cat gifts folder, and an attacker can display your cat gift file. So vulnerabilities kind of happen at all stages of an application uh, life cycle. Um, vulnerabilities can be exploited in a number of different ways, but there are two kind of major attack classes. One class is a local attack. This is an extremely powerful attacker that is on your machine. This uh, is realistic often, right? You might connect somewhere to submit your homework, for example, in this course or another course that you've seen. So you SSH into a server and you uh, submit your homework. When you're SSH into that server, you are a local attacker. This gives you some power, such as the ability to directly interact with an application through a lot of interaction channels, right? Through standard input, standard output, you might be able to send it what are called signals, operating system messages, uh, create files that you might have access to before running an application to uh, affect its behavior, and so forth. Um, the, uh, there are certain uh, vulnerabilities that might allow us to for a local privilege escalation, where because of the intricacies of how the system is set up or the uh, application works, you can run the application with more privileges than it expects you to have. Um, you can do other things, you can carefully craft the environment before running the application, right? So the application uh, expects there to be an environment variable, um, pointing to the folder of cat gifts, and you can change that before running it. That could be uh, an attack vector that only a local attacker can exploit. Um, in general, these attacks are the more powerful class of attacks, and there's, uh, but uh, in some sense, less impactful. You have, if I have a web server that has a local vulnerability, I don't really have to worry as much, right? Because the web server, on Google, the web server runs at google.com. None of you have SA access to google.com. If you do, I have other things to worry about, right? But if you don't, then any local uh, flaws in the application, uh, or any flaws in the application that are only exploitable by a local attacker aren't that big a deal. On the other hand, a remote attack is an attack that can be launched from the outside. On Google.com, I have a web server running. If someone can connect to that web server remotely and execute an attack, I have a very big problem. But these are generally are uh, more constrained. The web server is already running. You can't modify the file system and so forth before running a web server, uh, or rather, before connecting to a web server, because you don't have access to it. So in that sense, um, 
the remote attack, though it is much more directly applicable, it's harder to perform. Uh, that being said, remote attacks, I don't know if any of you are were cognizant cyber citizens uh, back in like the year 2004 or something. Uh, but there was a period of maybe eight years from the very early 2000, 2001, 2002, to like 2008, 2007, where every couple of weeks or every month, there would be a massive warm up. And the internet would become like a, a battleground. We weren't the people trying to stop the worm. Uh, I had a, in, in undergrad, I had a work study uh, at the university health desk. And one day, I had a really crappy sleep schedule, almost as bad as the sleep schedule I have now. Um, one day, I was up at like 5, 6 a.m. reading uh, Slashdot, which was the Reddit at its time. Uh, and I saw, it posed that, hey, there's a new massive worm attack going on. I don't remember what exactly it was, uh, which, which worm, uh, but I, I, I was reading all about it, like, oh, it already infected, you know, 380,000 hosts on the internet and it's spreading like crazy and, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, okay, I think I'm gonna be sick tomorrow for work. Called in sick, let someone else say that. I, was, I feel bad about that to this day, but these effects were uh, constant. Every month, you would have a massive warm outbreak driven by the capabilities of essentially remote attacks against different parts of internet infrastructure. Um, and interestingly, even though these attacks are harder to pull off, they're also harder to, to stop, right? So these massive warm attacks uh, that were ongoing for example, in uh, 2002, let's say, I, I, don't quote me on, on the year and the war in combination, but in 2002, there was a massive attack uh, that impacted a ton of um, SQL databases around the, the world. And there was also a worm, I think it was this specific worm, it's called SQL Slammer. And Slammer, in fact, it's on, and I think that this was the attack. Right? So I think in 2002, SQL Slammer infected millions of open databases on the internet, and the uh, uh, life cycle would be it would perform a remote attack, it would start scanning the internet and attacking anything that's found from its uh, new victim. SQL Slammer is still sending out messages. So 17 years later, SQL Slammer is still out there. Right, so these remote attacks are very, very hard to stop. It's much easier to purge local attackers from your machine than to purge remote attackers from the entire internet. So let's move on to how vulnerabilities might be introduced in such a way that these attacks can exist, right? Uh, typically, nowadays, we write applications in a high-level language. This wasn't the case back in you know, 1999 or, or whatnot, but, well, it was the case in 1999. Probably wasn't the case in like 1989. But nowadays, uh, we write applications in at least a language that is C level or higher, right? You don't typically write assembly to uh, create a web server. Um, that application is translated into an executable. It's called either the compilation or the justify compilation or, or whatnot process. Uh, we'll talk about interpretation in a second. It's loaded to memory, executed, runs, and eventually terminated. Right? It's very straightforward. I mentioned we'll talk about interpretation. Of course, it's easy to, to see how you write a program in C and it's compiled into an executable. And then you run it, you'll we'll actually talk about that in depth as well. But let's talk about interpretation first. So who here has used a uh, scripting language? Awesome. I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's very fun. Let's, uh, let's just launch a scripting language. There's a, an interpreter, IPython, it's an interactive Python interpreter. I can do cool stuff, just, just pulling stuff out of my hat. I can print every number 
from zero to 10, like a you know, one year old with a knife. So that's pretty cool. Um, in C, that would take tons of compilation and, and, and so forth. Um, the interesting thing is what you saw just there, I did a, uh, you know, import blah, 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 and I typed that in by text and it executed. You would think, okay, Python is an interpreted language. It takes every statement I write, interprets it, and executes it. That is actually not the case. It first compiles it <clears throat> to an, <clears throat> excuse me, to an intermediate representation. Well, let me show you what this looks like. It's called Python bytecode, and then that is what's actually interpreted. I'm gonna create a function that's gonna do what we did. Okay, so here is my function that <clears throat> can print out zero to 10. This is the bytecode. This is that function compiled into Python bytecode. <clears throat> and there are uh, tools you can use to uncompile it. There are tools you can use to view this bytecode. I didn't actually expect to go down the standard, so I don't have the tools uh, ready or I don't, I'd have to Google it. Um, but this is the bytecode, and you can kind of see it. <clears throat> so we uh, did a uh, zero through 10 range. What if we do a zero through uh, 65? We'll be able to see that change here. So, oh, no, no, we won't because it has, no. Does anyone see a capital A there anywhere? No. Anyways, the point is, this is the bytecode, however it goes that, uh, that you can, so we can of course change it to do a print twice. Nope. Here's the code, you can see it's longer now. Uh, and what got added, everything until here, it's roughly the same, right? Up until GH. And if you go on to here, there's another GH. So this looks like whatever this is, is the print pipe uh, null byte null byte GH. And then Q seems to be uh, the end of the for loop because there's also Q there after the last print. And actually, we can do a wrapped loop here. And now we can print it out again. And probably somewhere there'll be two Qs. And it's, so here we have GH, Q, and there's another Q. So Q something, no, W seems to be the break and then the point. Maybe, I don't know. We're just reading basically binary <coughs> crap uh, on my terminal. So the point is the Python that you write and the uh, JavaScript that you write, uh, I don't know about the bash that you write, just on the command line. Typically nowadays for, for kind of serious languages gets converted into a bytecode representation then executed. Your text isn't being executed directly. Um, the other thing that these uh, systems, these languages can do is create, execute stuff dynamically. So I can actually create text. I can say uh, x equals print, and I can say y equals hello, and I can say eval x plus y, oh, I can't, I can say exact x plus y, and it actually executes it, right? So there's some dynamic, uh, some level of, of, of kind of dynamic code building that can happen because in the language itself, it has the capabilities to uh, compile the code, generate that bytecode, and execute it, right? In, in uh, kind of the, the language runtime. If you're writing an application C, which we'll get to next, uh, you don't have this capability. So let's talk about C. 
And who here has written uh, in C before? All right. Uh, was it required for this course? Mm -hmm. Right? No? Okay. All right. Well, C is, uh, of course, kind of the, the granddaddy of uh, compiled languages. Uh, it wasn't the first one, but it was the first one that kind of lit the world on fire, let's say. Um, C is a language that is uh, a little obtuse. There's uh, reasons for things being in C the way they are that are a little confusing to someone jumping in, but let's um, just show an example C code. So here's hello world in C. Now let's just uh, be nice here and include cdio.h. This is a library that produces that provides this puts functionality, and then hopefully you've all seen this. You compile something and you run it. Did anyone notice that when I type ex, I automatically finish the exploit by accident? Uh, all right, example. And then it says hello world, right? Um, C is a language that is not interpreted. You write it, you compile it, and then that produces an executable that you then run. This has a couple of uh, side effects. So for one, all I need to do, all I need in order to run this example now is the example and some uh, libraries associated with it. The example is not very big, it's eight kilobytes that is produced. We can strip it down to be much smaller. Whereas uh, for Python and the libraries associated with this are a couple facts. An entire Python runtime is tens of megabytes, right? So it's much more, uh, uh, much smaller. Um, it is also uh, much faster and much more controllable. Right? When you write C, that is more or less what is going to be executed on your system. You don't have to uh, worry about Python doing weird things and, and so forth. Um, let's talk about this compilation process. Right? I just did uh, GCC example into example that's the example that produced from my C source code an executable file that I can launch directly. This skipped a couple of steps, or rather it did it for me. The first step in compiling an executable is, and you can run it with this dash s step. Uh, actually the first step, so we have this example, whoop. That's the binary. We have this example that C. We include stdio.h. That is uh, some syntactic sugar C gives us that uh, can be resolved by the C preprocessor. This is the first step. The C preprocessor, CPP or preprocessor, takes the included file and paste it into my source code. So this is some crazy stuff that uh, all together adds up to my ability to print hello world. And then at the end, here's my little hello world. So already things are getting a little complicated. Then we uh, do the compilation step where my code is translated into a lower level language. So similar to Python being translated to bytecode. In uh, compilation, my code is translated to assembly. So now you can take this step two. Typically, dot s. This is now assembly code. So you can see it. Uh, I can recognize some things. You can recognize the lower world. Um, but and 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 actually, it is once again minified. In some sense, a lot of the, the junk that was in that SCDIO that I should include is gone, and we see just code. This is the function. This is super, super, super close 
to the actual instructions running on, on the machine when you compile it. Basically, or the next step is called assembling it from assembly to uh, binary code. When we assemble it, essentially what happens is all of these are converted directly to ones and zeros, right? So push QRPP is converted to eight bytes directly. So this is kind of a, a, a direct mapping of what will end up running on your CPU, which is super cool. And you see it's like set something up, it moves, it'll, it'll go into what those are, and then it calls what's, and that's, you know, very, uh, this is super intuitive, right, everyone? Um, and of course, it calls puts, and that's when we get the, the put. And you've heard of, you know, you can return, let's return 42 here instead of just uh, exiting. So then let's see what that looks like in our code. So we first do the pre-processing step, then we do the uh, compilation step into assembly. And if we look here, we see that here's our 42, and that's gonna be what's returned in then. Pretty cool stuff. All right, all right. Then the next step is we, we went from source code, we pre-processed it, then we have pre-processed source code. Then we did the compilation step. Usually when people say compile a program, they mean directly to a computable form. Compiling it actually does the step, when properly uses actually does the step of converting it into that assembly. From there, we use an assembler to create uh, the binary file. Let me show you what this looks like. We just run AS, example step three, and we output example step four dot O, okay. Now this is what's called an object file. An object file has, so is no longer text that we can read. We can read this just fine. That's Vim. This is what happens when I try to open this object file. So you can still see a little world in there. See some metadata, Ubuntu 7.4.0-1. So the 7.4.0 is my GCC version. Right, so it, it puts some metadata. Uh, but the rest of it is kind of insane. It is a binary format now, not for human consumption. Um, it contains the code that was directly translated from my assembly into binary. Contains some metadata that will be used to create the final executable. Uh, spoiler alert, this isn't yet the final executable. Uh, it contains information about uh, symbols. So if I have, you know, uh, various variables, it'll have information about them. Um, and debug information if I had uh, included it during the compilation step. So to all of these steps, I can add a dash G. If you ever debug your, your YDC code, you compile it with dash G. You debug symbols, that's what, what happens there. And then the final step, is the linker. And the linker combines the uh, object file with other object files. In this case, we only have one object file, so that's easy. Um, resolves a couple of inter-object dependencies. So if I had one .c file that uh, called a function in another .c file, and I can find a complete an object file, then I need the linker to figure out where the function that is being called by one uh, is in the other, that it'll do that resolution. Um, it will uh, also, optionally, include uh, the, all of the libraries that you need statically inside your file. Um, otherwise, it'll leave them as um, kind of external references. Hey, when I run, I need the standard C library and I need puts. We're going to look at that in a second. And it produces an executable format. This is what you can actually execute. Common um, executable formats. Um, in uh, Linux world, um, 
and in FreeBSD world and so forth, it's um, vectorial format is called an ELF, not a domestical creature, it's the executable and linkable format. <laughs> and uh, in Windows, it's called the uh, P. Uh, I just blanked on what P stands for. What does P stand for? Portable. Portable executable, that's right. Um, on Mac OS, it's called Mach O, M A C H dash O, um, and so forth. It's not a big deal. They're all more or less the same concept in a different form. Now let's explore what that concept is. So let me produce it first. Uh, honestly, I don't remember all of the flags to LD to go from this to uh, an executable. I mean, I, I, I can get there, but it won't be runnable. No, I see. Um, so we're going to cheat a little bit and we're going to let GCC figure out for us. GCC will call LD uh, for us with the necessary stuff. And then we have our example, right? So the example file is an application on my machine that tells me what type of file the argument is. The example is an ELF, an executable in linkable format. It is 64 bits. Uh, it is, I uh, will go through what a lot of this other stuff means. Um, one thing that I'd point out is dynamically linked. I mentioned that on the last slide, we'll talk about that in a sec. And this can actually be executed. All right. Now we've gone through the entire life cycle of a program, a C program from here is the source code that we wrote through the different compilation steps to here is um, the executable. All right. L file. Uh, come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, it used to be that the standard type of file you produced would define where in memory it was going to get loaded, and you get loaded in a very specific location, and then control would come there in the processor, and you would start executing stuff. Uh, nowadays, L files are mostly. Um, Relocatable executable, so they are loaded in a random location memory that's for safety, so that an attacker doesn't know where in memory the code is. Uh, this protects against classes of attacks that you'll go into later. Um, else aren't always executable, right? So in this case, it is an executable file uh, because I can execute it. But an L file is also produced from a core dump. So when your program crashes, let's make my program crash. How uh, it's an easy way to make my program crash. Let's say I have a <coughs> array and I do reference some um, out of bounds part of the array. If I run crash, it'll set fault. When this happens, it can dump its memory into uh, a file. Okay. And then I have this core file. And that is also on that. The core file is not executable. It is just a file that contains all of the code that is running when the process ran. And what's a nice way to bundle code? ELF. So ELF is a format. It's not intrinsically a um, executable. Uh, and the format itself is actually uh, in architecture independent. <coughs> you have the same format as in the same metadata, but not the same content of an L file on x86, on ARM, uh, on MIPS, on different processor architectures. So let's look at some tools to look at what this L file actually is. Um, one nice tool is read ELF. 
So readout dash a will just basically dump all of the uh, headers of a L file. Let's look through our L file here. So this is our L. These are the headers that it, that it has, or uh, all sorts of metadata that it has, and we go through uh, some interesting stuff. For one thing, uh, you can see that uh, it's a 64-bit L on that class. Uh, metadata right here, so that I have my system is 64-bit. There's a 64-bit thing. It is a, uh, the, the location, the offset in the file, because this is a, uh, uh, relocatable executable. The offset of the file that execution should begin is at this OX uh, hexadecimal 530. There's a bunch of uh, section headers that describe different parts of the file. Uh, one that we're interested in is dot text. Whoops. That text is the section of the file that contains the executable data. And you can see, uh, of course, all these numbers are kind of confusing. This number here is where in the file this section is. And where in the file is that text? It's at 530, right? Which is also where we should start execution. So uh, 530 uh, is actually the beginning of the text segment. We start execution at the beginning of the text section. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, we have section where there is uh, data that is read writable and then where there's data that's read only and so forth. Then we have another class of headers called program headers that describe how to load this executable into memory. Uh, and specifically, they say there are two parts of the executable, and they're loaded into two different parts of memory, and so forth. It's not as important right now, but this is how an L creates a process. When you watch example, it looks at all of these headers, it loads stuff into memory, and executes it at the specific offset that it's sold to. Very cool. All right. Oh, and here's the typical out section. Uh, we talked about text. That's uh, the program code. I'm not sure why it's called dot text, but it is. Uh, I probably knew at some point. We have dot data. I pointed that out. That's uh, read writable data, like global variables that have an initial value that you read and write. There is uh, read-only data, so that's where our hello world would be. And then there is something called the BSS, which is filled with, uh, which is there for uninitialized data. So if you create a global variable that you don't set an initial value to, it'll end up in the BSS. These two are separated because the BSS, you don't actually have to store anything in the file. You can just say we have a section that you should map to memory of this size, whereas Data that is initialized and needs to actually store in the file. So it's a way of reducing the file size. Um, and then you have some preprocessors and, and, and post processors in uh, the sections dot any and dot finny. Um, if you have ever uh, written like C and you have um, destructors with uh, kind of the, some of the advanced shared pointer. Um, functionality modern C++. So the, uh, your object will automatically be garbage collected when you exit the program. You might end up uh, with code infinity, for example. Um, yeah. And then moving on, what is the actual code that runs in these apps? Right, so that is, is basically a vehicle for shipping code. The actual code is uh, binary code. And we looked at the assembly, and we actually looked at the binary code in the uh, And the binary code is architecture specific. So C itself is not necessarily architecture specific. I can take that whole world file 
and I can compile it for uh, any number of different architectures. I can compile it for x86 64 bit, like I did. That's my laptop. I can compile it like, uh, for ARM, which is what is the cross architecture that is running on your phones. For MIPS, cross architecture that's running on most of your you know, home Wi Fi routers and all of this stuff. Um, in this class, we are going to be talking about x86. x86 is uh, kind of you trace its lineage, one of the oldest uh, processor architectures uh, that we still use. Um, and uh, I would say it's the most common, but it's definitely the most common among your laptops, right? But of course, you have some of the phones, you have some of the other smart devices that are all running ARM or MIPS or some other crap. But x86 is the best one. It's, it's very cool. Uh, x86 started out live way back when as these two processors, 8088 and 8086. But Intel made these processors uh, with 16-bit uh, registers, uh, no memory management, et cetera, et cetera, no modern features. And then they gradually built them over the decades. Um, 8386 is the first kind of recognizable modern processor. Um, that uh, we have. It's uh, that 32 bit uh, CPU, so you can have uh, 32 bits, uh, 32 bit numbers reading about at one time. Uh, you can have up to 32 bit addressing of memory, so that's uh, four gigs of memory that you could have in a 32 bit computer. And they started adding stuff to that. Um, in uh, late middle school, or maybe in late elementary school, I don't remember, the Pentium came out. Uh, the Pentium was a kind of big um, upgrade uh, to like the old 386 line. Then there was like the Pentium 3 in high school, all the cool kids had Pentium 3s. Uh, you could get something like up to 700 megahertz or something initially, and then they, they, they sped it up more and more. Then Intel kind of lost their way with the Pentium 4, um, started blundering. Henry Ford wasn't very impressive. Uh, and AMD came in during that era and uh, revolutionized x86 by extending it to 64 bits. That's what all of your, or many of you are running on your laptops. Some of your laptops could be ARM. Um, and then Intel has kept up with the core processors. They left pending behind and they created this uh, core i3, i5, i7, i9. Not that those are. Uh, chronological, but you know, different classes of, of their processors. So this is kind of the, the x86 CPU family. x86 uh, processors, actually all processors have um, a couple of sort of uh, different concepts. Have you all taken computer organization? Yeah. There's at least one person that that should have no. They're going to very quickly talk about how a computer works. Just real quick, we have um, a computer. Let's say this is this is a computer. In a computer, you have a CPU. This is a very uh, simplified version, of course. You have memory, right, RAM. You have your hard drive or SSD or whatever, disk. You load programs into RAM, and then you execute them. But what actually does the execution is your CPU, right? Your CPU goes instruction by instruction, and it pulls it from RAM, and it executes it. But the problem is, if you've built a computer before, RAM is like this little stick that you plug into the motherboard, and the CPU is like five centimeters away, and the data can only travel from RAM to the CPU, best case, at the speed of light. But then there's all, a whole bunch of other electronics in the way, slowing everything down, 
doing other logic and so forth. This is actually insanely slow. You have to read every instruction in your CPU from RAM and write all the effects out to RAM. The modern uh, kind of internet will not exist. Definitely video calling will not exist, right? This sort of thing. So instead, there is a caching layer in the CPU. And whereas uh, pulling data from RAM could take hundreds or thousands of clock cycles, pulling data from the cache into the actual processing core takes, let's say, 10 clock cycles. So data is pulled into RAM, and then the CPU pulls it from RAM into cache, the processor cache, and writes out the results at its leisure. But this is still too slow. This takes tens of cycles uh, when you say, like, my CPU runs at log gigahertz. You know, 10 of those cycles every second will be spent trying to get data from cache. That's not good. And so there's actually even closer to the processor pieces of data that are right on the processor, and these are called registers. So the CPU pulls data from cache into these registers and acts on the registers directly. And that is where your uh, kind of the, the magic happens, right? And that's finally fast enough. This is simplified uh, in modern architecture. There's multiple levels of caching. Uh, there's multiple cores. Uh, each core has multiple uh, execution, um, what are they called? The things that execute the individual threads and so forth. Um, but the important thing is how we understand the need for registers and what a register is. So a register is basically the scratch space for a processor to perform operations on data. Uh, and here I have to take another uh, kind of pause and mention that um, this is all about 32-bit x86. Since then, over the last, I don't know, 10 years, um, we have gone squarely into 64-bit architecture. So all of your laptops, unless they are from, you know, 2009 or something, uh, probably running a 64-bit um, uh, x86 CPU, so this is a little outdated. That being said, on 32-bit x86, there are four general purpose uh, registers, these guys that are just used for, for anything. So there's EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. Um, they all have uh, some history to why they're called what they are. EAX started life in 8086 as a uh, register called A. There's the accumulator, right? That's where you would like add things to, to accumulate them. Um, and if you remember from computer architecture, there are entire uh, processor architectures that just have an accumulator. That's like the only way you can mess with data is to add and subtract it to this accumulator. Uh, when x86, or when, you know, 8086 moved to 16-bit, uh, A got grown into 16-bit uh, register, and they called it AX, A extended. And AX has two parts to it, AH, which is the high uh, eight bits, and AL, which are the low eight bits. So if you, you know, of course, draw it from right to left as a reasonable person, here's your register. This is a, a actually, we're going to rebel a little bit and talk about the full 64 bit register. This is 16 of it, or 32 of it. This is 16. This, as it's up there, is AX, 
this is AH, this is AL, right? So if you store the number, you know, five, it's a very small number, it fits in uh, basically three bits. It's 101. It would all, all of those by that bits would go into AL. If you store number 257, that's nine bits. One zero 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 one. Right now you have data in age and so forth. And you can actually interact with these, uh, or a CPU can uh, interact with these uh, kind of separately. It can talk directly to age without impacting AL. Then when uh, the upgrade to 32 bit happened, they said, okay, now we can have DAX. So I guess AX probably stands for A extended. EAX maybe stands for extremely extended. I don't know. So now we have EAX, and here is uh, AX, uh, AHAL, still addressable by the CPU. Then AMD came along and they said, you know what? It's time to bring x86 into the 64 bit era. And they created 64 bit registers. And the 64-bit EAX is called RAX, I guess really extended. <laughs> um, and uh, that's where we are today. On 32-bit, you have these four uh, general purpose registers and two other ones that are basically general purpose, have some special meaning, uh, ESI and EDI. Um, and uh, that's 32 bit and 64 bit. In there, uh, is during Wisdom AMD created a ton of additional um, uh, general purpose registers. And they just started numbering them instead of giving them few letters. So you have stuff like R10, R11, R12, and so on. Yeah. What was the, within AX, there's like two of them on the A1 and A8? A L and A8. Yeah. What are those meaning again? Lower and higher. And when, when we made the jump from 8 bit to 16 bit, we kept the 8 bit uh, register addressable as A lower and add another 8 bits A higher. You can also address them directly, or you can address both of them as AX. Yeah. All right, so, uh, oh yeah, and then as I mentioned, two registers are reserved for these sort of uh, high bandwidth memory transfer with special instructions, uh, ESI and EDI, or in modern times, RSI and RDI. Uh, they're also usable, perfectly fine as general purpose registers. In fact, on 64-bit, they're used to pass arguments into function. Um, and then there are a bunch of uh, special purpose registers that are used for uh, specific tasks. One of them is the stack pointer. Um, it's called ESP on 32-bit, RSP on 64-bit. And let me just check if we're diving into stack. Okay, we're diving into stack later. We're still doing the overview. Cool. Um, who here remembers what the program stack is from computer architecture card computer organization? All right, cool. We'll uh, probably not this week, unless maybe we can get there, but maybe next week we'll, uh, next class we'll dive into that. Um, and uh, RBP slash EBP on 32 bit is the frame pointer. Uh, these help track the uh, stack, which is where local variables, the functions, and uh, basically the breadcrumb trail that allow the function to return to the function that calls it is stored. Uh, so there are all these registers. There's uh, some additional complexity. Uh, back in 32 bit days, uh, the memory was. Uh, not actually viewed, I guess back in 16-bit days, really, memory wasn't viewed as a continuous um, 
uh, you know, thing. Uh, it was actually viewed as different segments that could be addressed in special ways. So in order to uh, support that, there are these segment registers that are still that were still used in 32-bit are no longer used in 64-bit that will allow you to address data with a simple offset so tracking where it was in that range. Um, it's kind of a bummer that they got rid of these if they would have been uh, potentially useful security features in 64-bit processors. Uh, and then there are, uh, there's this kind of um, execution flag registers that uh, track the results of different comparisons that uh, have different settings on how certain other instructions could work, uh, should work, and so forth. Um, this was B flags. It was, of course, originally flags. And then in 32 bit, it became E flags. And then in uh, 64 bit, what did it become? R flags. Exactly. Uh, and then the instruction pointer, right? I mentioned the CPU starts executing instructions one by one, pulling them from memory, or really it pulls memory to cache, pulls the instructions from cache. It uh, knows where the instruction is because there's a register that points to the next instruction that will get. Right? All your instructions in memory, you saw an example uh, that C that when we compile it, the first instruction that was going to be executed was that this uh, hex uh, 530 offset. That was going to be the uh, what the initial uh, instruction pointer was set to, and then it would just kind of uh, tick upward slowly unless it was, uh, unless our program changed execution in some major way. When does this pass end, Max? Okay, perfect. <clears throat> All right. And then, um, so that's where there are instructions that modify the, the instruction pointer. You can call a function and that says instruction pointer. To point to that function, you can return from a function and it sets it back to where you started. Um, uh, and uh, then there are other, uh, all sorts of other registers, uh, registers to track floating point numbers to allow floating point operations. Uh, registers, nowadays, there are insane amounts of uh, kind of multimedia registers, registers that have 512 bits that you can uh, use to uh, encode and decode uh, video very quickly and so forth. Uh, it's kind of the feature creep of x86, but also what makes x86 super cool. So data in x86 and then all modern computer architectures nowadays is stored in little endian. What does this mean? This means it is stored backwards. So we talked about how you had the number 257, you would have one in this uh, higher uh, AH uh, range, and then 001 in AL. And let's actually talk about the number 258 so that we can have a little bit of a difference here. So 258 in hex is 0x. Uh, 102, yeah, I got confused for a second. 0x102, uh, it's stored in binary like this. So there's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, right? When that is stored to memory, little endian architectures will reverse the bytes. So when you store this to memory, when you store this to memory, just erase this RX. When you store this to memory, you would actually store it as in hacks, let's say, right? This is 0, 1, 0, 2, where, uh, where how it is right here. You would actually store it as 0, 2, Zero, 01. And when you read it in, you would reverse it. Um, why might this be? 
Probably those in my 466 class are just uh, shy, but know this. Uh, this is the way it is because when you move from, well, there are a number of reasons. One is back in the day, memory was stored on, uh, yeah, back in the day, memory was stored on uh, like tapes or some crap, right? Like you're talking in the 60s. And these tapes would take a long time to read. You would read them byte by byte or bit by bit. So the faster you could get to kind of the, the precision of the number, the better for a lot of algorithms, especially if the number was small. This is an anecdotal thing. What is, uh, uh, that's an anecdotal reason. Another reason for uh, Little Endian is when you're talking about memory locations and you've suddenly gone from eight bits to 16 bits, and eight bits, of course, you only have one byte, there's no idea as to speak of, to store the byte. And you got to 16 bits, you have to decide, do I store the byte backwards? or not. And the reason why you would store them backwards is memory addressing between the modes becomes a lot easier. If you had an array of eight byte of eight bit um, data that you would index into in your old algorithm, and then it suddenly went to 16 bit data, and you only still wanted to deal with it as a bit because that's how you wrote your source code. You could just double each address if you stored it backwards. If you didn't, you'd have to double it and add one. So, uh, for better or worse, everything uses little endian uh, nowadays. Uh, even architectures that started out not doing so have moved to little endian. So it used to be that PowerPC. The architecture that uh, old school Max or old school Max ran on other architectures. Middle school Max ran on uh, PowerPC. Now Max uses Intel, but even PowerPC machines are now low ended. They used to be big engine back in the day. Uh, MIPS used to mostly be, be big engine. Now most variants are, of MIPS that are in use are little engine. Uh, that's a sweeping statement because most. Uh, variants that I've uh, ARM, same sort of thing. There are big endian variants of ARM, but the little endian variants are outcompeting them. Um, it's uh, an interesting phenomenon. Then, let's talk about how numbers are actually stored in these registers, specifically in terms of um, signedness. So if you store numbers, for any sort of mathematical algorithm, you'll eventually need to talk about negative numbers. We have interacted with a negative number in their lives. <laughs> Good. So, give me an example of a positive number. Three. Awesome. <laughs> give me an example of a negative number. Negative five. Negative. I, I like negative, let's go with negative five. All right, so you have three and negative five. How would you store three? Let's say we have an eight bit architecture. How would you store three in AL? Four zeros. Four zeros. And another one. Zero, zero, one, one. Awesome. That's three. So then the question becomes how do you store negative five? There are two ways. One is we say, all right, well, we only have eight bits. They say, let's reserve the top bit for um, being a, 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 a sign bit. And we've set that. So now this whole number is negative. A zero, zero, zero. And then zero, one, zero, one. Right here's the halfway point. That's negative five. So now we have this interesting uh, problem. One is we cut our total number of, like our, our maximum number that we can reason about in half, right? Because 
Here we could go all the way up to 255, like then again with all ones. Here we can't. All right. And then there's another unfortunate thing that happens in this scenario. And we can see it if we try to add three and negative five. So if you add three and negative five, what what is that bitwise? If you add three and negative five, we get negative eight. That's not very uh, good. And also if we add this negative eight to negative five, we get zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, which is 12. Right, so this is awkward. Uh, is it 12? Yeah, it should be. Thank you. Cool. All right. So that's awkward. So let's not do that. Let's let's come up with a better way to store negative numbers. And it turns out that that better way is called two's complement. Two's complement. Actually, one more thing. What happens to zero when we subtract one in our our old format? It rolls over, of course, and you get all ones. And zero minus one ends up being negative uh, 127, right? So that's, that's not good either. So some very bright people created something called two's complement. And it says, hey, what's zero minus one? Zero minus one is all ones. It's all ones. That, that's just going to be negative one. All ones is negative one. That minus one. This is negative two. This is negative three, and so on. And it's weird to humans. Like this doesn't look like negative three to you, right? But it's actually very good for computers. Zero minus one becomes uh, something that makes sense to the computer, and then you can add one to it again, and it'll go back off to zero. And then, if you have, let's, let's then do, just do negative one here. If you add, if you add three and negative one, what do we get? Spoiler alert, we get Two, like you're supposed to. So it's a it's a weird um, thing for for humans. One thing that keeps it if this is one, the number is still negative. So you can easily to me tell if the number is negative. But arithmetic operations now make sense again to the computer, and uh, the computer doesn't have to explicitly keep track of side or unside operations. Cool. Thank you all. Uh, I guess I will keep the next class, but it's been a pleasure. I'll see you in my 466 when you're ready.